Yeah. So yesterday we finished by talking about uh, Brown versus the Board of Education, I believe, somewhere in that neighborhood anyway. Um, and of course, Brown versus the Board of Education are actually Supreme Court cases aren't whoever versus whoever. It's always the for some reason. So Brown v. Uh, the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas is actually the full name of the case. 1952, 1953, somewhere in that time frame, there's a family in Topeka, Kansas that wants to enroll their child in a particular school. She's not allowed to enroll because she is a, a, a black child and the school is an all-white child. So by design, they knew what was going to happen. They knew that she would be denied admittance and then they would um, have grounds to establish a lawsuit, the NAACP and the girl's family. And so that's exactly what happens. Um, the NAACP, um, on behalf of the Brown family, sues the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. Um, it makes its way through the courts. It's finally heard by the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, Thurgood Marshall, if you remember that name. Everybody remember that name? Who was Thurgood Marshall? Uh, who was Thurgood Marshall? He ended up being the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. But at this time, he's a lawyer for the NAACP. He argues the case, and they win. And the result of the Brown versus the Board of Education case is that segregation is deemed to be unconstitutional. With these words, separate but equal is inherently unequal. It can't be equal, and it will never be equal. And so that sets aside um, Plessy v. Ferguson, and separate but equal is no longer a thing, or is it? Well, let me give you an example. I was six, five years old when I started school. It was 1968. I was about to turn six. 1968 is the first year that city schools in Macon were desegregated. So it took 14 years for Macon to integrate their school system. And that was pretty normal. And we'll talk about why that is when we talk more about Brown v. the Board of Education. So at least on paper, separate but equal is gone. It takes a while to put it into effect. Now, while all this is going on, African Americans are not just sitting back and taking it. At least they begin to react in some different ways. They begin to respond. There's different responses. This gentleman is Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington believed that the way for blacks to advance in this country was through hard work and education. He actually thought that the races should not be integrated. In fact, in 1895 at the International Cotton Exposition, he makes a speech. And in the speech, he says that segregation is the way things should be and that African Americans should better themselves through hard work and education. That's the way to gain equality. Basically, to let equality come to you. 19, well, let me back up for just a second. At the International Cotton Exposition, how do you think his speech was received? Think about who's attending the International Cotton Exposition. White folks, black folks, both? No. No. White folks. How do they receive what Booker T. Washington says? You are the man, Booker T. The black community does not receive that as well. Um, nevertheless, Washington continues to speak out and say that integration is not the way. Segregation is the way. Um, hard work and education are the way to gain equality. 1901, he's invited to the White House. He becomes the first African American to visit the White House probably best known for being the founder of the Tuskegee Institute. It's now a university in Tuskegee, Alabama. Uh, but back then, it taught people how to teach farmers and tradesmen, craftsmen. In other words, to give people vocational education. 
Um, it is a an HBUC, Historically Black University of College, probably most famous for the Tuskegee Airmen. Anybody ever heard of them? The Red Tails um, fought in Europe were... Um, they were black American pilots, all from Tuskegee Institute, um, and were a very decorated um, group of pilots. So that's Booker T. Washington. Equality will come through hard work and education. Just sit back and wait for it to happen. Do not integrate the races. W.E.B. Du Bois, on the other hand, believes that African Americans should speak up and speak out constantly for civil and social and political rights. In other words, you have to be proactive. You can't sit and wait for equality to come to you. You've got to go out and grab it by the horns, so to speak. He believed that Washington had been too compromising with the rights of black Americans. And so he is in total disagreement with Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington is better known and more accepted by the white community, but W.E.B. Du Bois is more accepted throughout the black community. He's a professor at Atlanta University, um, and it's while he's there he founds the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or the NAACP. Um, the purpose of the NAACP is to promote and to carry out legal challenges to discrimination, segregation, disenfranchisement. Um, so in other words, they're going to fight for civil rights using what? Three-letter word. Starts with L, ends with W. The law. The law. Um, and, of course, the NAACP is, um, is kind of the heartbeat of the civil rights movement. There's some other organizations. We'll talk about those when we talk about civil rights. But the NAACP is right there, and they are at the forefront. They are leading the charge for equality in America. All right. Any questions about W.E.B. Du Bois? He has a nice beard. He'd be a Van Dyke pointy on the end. It's very nice. Huh? And I don't know. It's just a guy who first wore that particular facial hair, I guess. I don't know. Du Bois, which if that was my name, I'd be called W.E.B. too, or Dr. Du Bois. All right. So African-Americans, again, don't just sit back and wait for things to happen. They begin to organize. In, I think it's 1905. I didn't put a date on there, but um, the Niagara Movement is founded by W.E.B. Du Bois, and it becomes the cornerstone of the civil rights movement. It all begins right here with the Niagara Movement. It's called the Niagara Movement because it was held at Niagara Falls. And while there, while they're meeting, they put together a list of demands for segregation to end and for discrimination to end. And so it's a demand of the rights of people. Um, 1909, again, after the Niagara Movement, 1909, the NAACP is um, established. And again, it worked for the rights of African Americans, particularly the legal rights of African Americans. And it, it, it did it through the legal system. There's not violence. There's not, you know, anything of that nature. It is through the law that... Um, the NAACP works. Um, du Bois actually leaves Atlanta University. He comes back later to teach again, um, but works full-time for the NAACP in New York and eventually becomes better known than Booker T. Washington. Certainly has a, a greater impact. 
He helps found the National Urban League in 1910, and that is an interesting organization. Um, it's an interesting organization because of what it attempts to do. It's found in major cities, primarily in the north, and they work to solve social problems that African Americans have in the cities. Things like education, health care, food, jobs, living conditions. All of those things are uh, part of what the National Urban League tries to do. One big thing that it does is it assists people when they move from the rural south to the urban north. Just imagine you're 19 years old. You leave Milledgeville, Georgia. You move to Chicago, Illinois, and you do not know a soul. You don't know where you're going to work. You don't know where you're going to live. Who steps in to help? The Urban League. That's what they do. And it was very well received and was very effective. Here's the NAACP at one of their anniversary celebrations. Um, I tried to find Dr. Du Bois, and I can't find him in that picture. He might have been dead by that time. I think this is Dr. Benjamin Mays right here, so Dr. Du Bois was dead. Um, and again, here's their national seal or their symbol. Um, I think it's interesting that the NAACP has changed a lot over the past 112 years. Um, but one thing that hasn't changed is their name, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And how many of y'all use or have heard the term colored? Do you hear a lot, though? No. Probably you've heard somebody who's really using the term colored. Whether they're black or white, they use the term colored. Um, and I think it's interesting the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People has not changed this term on the end. I mean, it could very well be the National Association for the Advancement of African Americans. Nah. Nah. Y'all get that one? Nah. Okay. Got it. He's a little slow today. Um, and, and again, that's an interesting use of words, and it shows how words have changed over time. Um, I, I met a woman who was 101 years old. She was a World War II veteran. She was African-American. And um, had, you know, lived a long and fruitful life. And I remember hearing her speak, and she got up and she introduced herself. Well, you know, somebody had already introduced her, but she stood up and, and she began to speak. She said what her name was, and she said, I am not black. Well, she was but she said, I am not black. And she said, I suppose you're wondering how I would identify myself. She said, well, I am not an African-American. And we're all like, baby, we're running out of, out of terms. What, you know, how would you identify yourself? identify yourself? She said, I am a Negro. And all of us kind of looked at each other and went, well, you know, technically she's right. That is the, the scientific term for a specific race of people, Negro. Um, I was watching a movie last night and this morning. I actually finished it this morning because, uh, you know, I'm bored sometimes. And it's called Glory Road. Anybody ever seen it? It's a basketball movie about Texas Western University in 1965, 1966. Um, Don Haskins becomes the coach there. He needs to recruit players. He goes out and recruits seven black basketball players to come to El Paso, Texas. Okay? And turns out they end up being pretty good. But you've got seven black players. I think it's five or six white players. They have to learn how to live with each other. They have to learn how to rely on one another and love one another and, and you know, become family. Have to learn how to fight with one another. Um. 
And, and they do. And, and there's this scene where this white kid named Jerry Armstrong from Missouri is sitting on the porch with four or five of his black teammates. And he says, I got a question. And they all said, okay. Um, are, are you colored or are you black? Because I really think y'all, we all want to be referred to as colored. And they just laugh at him. And finally, one of them says, no, we're, we're black. We're black. And so you can see this progression of terms that are used to refer to a particular group of people. But colored people is something we don't say much in 2021. We would say what? Well, even that's kind of fallen by the wayside. And we would say African-American. Okay? So I just think it's interesting the NAACP has stayed with that particular um, name for so long when, you know, things have changed so much uh, since their inception. Anyway. All right. Um, this is the symbol for the National Urban League. What is it? Equality. Okay. Um, and let's just say that you're a, a young, again, 19 year old. You are coming from Milledgeville, Georgia. You've got on your overalls and your brogans, or you've got on a simple house dress, and you get off the train in Chicago, Illinois, and you look A, terrified, B, lost, C, both of those things are true. And somebody from the Chicago League, um, or basically be the Chicago Urban League, sees you, they walk up to you, they introduce themselves, and they hand you this card. What does it do? It gives you somebody that will help you. It gives you a phone number. It gives you an address. And you can go. If you need help finding a job, if you need help finding a place to live, if you just need people to, to get to know, the Urban League can help you do that. And I think that's a pretty cool thing. Um, you know, we, we have things kind of like that called, uh, you know, the welcome wagon. People new to a community move in and people, you know, respond to them and help them out and that kind of thing. But this is, this is on a much broader scale. It's kind of a neat thing, neat idea. All right. Um, this is the Niagara movement. Here's Dr. Du Bois right here in the middle. And what do you notice about the faces in that particular picture? Some of them are what? White. Yeah, they are. Um, and I think it's easy to forget when we start talking about civil rights that there were white people who protested and marched and spoke out and bled and died during the civil rights movement because they were courageous enough to speak out. They were courageous enough to speak their convictions. And, and that really began to happen after World War II because, you know, people realized we've got problems here at home and we need to fix them. And the big one is this idea of civil rights. So this becomes the cornerstone of the civil rights movement. Um, you know, that we talk about with Martin Luther King. It's, it's on these shoulders that Martin Luther King stood. It's on Martin Luther King's shoulders that we stand today. Um, and so it's important. Again, here's another example. It's important for us to study the past so that we know um, our present. I like that. Write that down. It's important that we study the past so that we know our present. Huh. Nobody will ever remember that. All right. A couple of people, actually three people, and, and then we're done. Um, John and Lugenia Burns Hope. This is John Hope. John Hope is a native of Augusta, Georgia, um, and he was a civil rights leader. He's one of those upon which Martin Luther King stood upon. Um, 
he is the president of Atlanta University. Ding, ding, ding. Who taught at Atlanta University? W.E.B. Du Bois. So they are working together. In fact, many professors at Atlanta University are part of that early civil rights movement. And as we get closer and closer to, to Martin Luther King Jr., we learn about people like Benjamin Mays, who is MLK's mentor, teacher. Um, so he stands on the shoulders of Benjamin Mays. Benjamin Mays stood on the shoulders of John and Lugenia. By the way, if you ever name your daughter Lugenia, I will hunt you down and I will hurt you. Lugenia? Really? It does no. Just think of it, girls. Lugenia Patel. Wow. But Lugenia? It sounds like her daddy's name was Eugene, and they had to figure out some way to name her after her daddy. I don't know. So, John is the president of Atlanta University. Um, he and Du Bois think a lot alike. They believe that the way for equality among African Americans is that they should actively work for it, protest, use the legal system, um, make people aware of what's going on in the country. Now, um, Hope, John, is part of um, the group that organizes the NAACP. Lugenia. She looks like a nice, mild-mannered woman, right? She's actually pretty ferocious. She's ferocious in what she does. While her husband is working with the NAACP, and he's the academic, or the academic, you know, he's the president of a university, she's out getting her hands dirty. She's working in the black community. And remember, what happened after the race riot is the black community kind of isolates itself. Well, the city of Atlanta is like, okay, well, you know, we really won't worry about the black community then. But the black community still has the same needs as the broader community. They need sanitation, right? Need their trash taken care of. They need electricity. They need plumbing. Um, their roads need to be repaired. They need good health care. Um, and they need education. And so Lugenia Burns Hope, that's what she's doing. She's kind of down in the trenches, getting her hands dirty, working, making sure that these things are happening in the city of Atlanta. Um, so she's, she's actually one of my favorite people that comes out of this part of the New South, simply because of her name, Lugenia. But more importantly, because she, she worked. She got her hands dirty. She put her, she put her hands where her words were. Does that make sense? You know, she puts her money where her where her mouth is, um, and she works, and she works to try to improve people's lives. Somebody, I don't know if it was in this class or one of the others, asked if there were any African Americans during this time that became wealthy. Anybody remember asking that question? Must have been fifth period then. And the answer to that question is yes. This is Alonzo Herndon. Alonzo Herndon was a barber. He started a barber shop. And he was good at what he did. In fact, he becomes the owner of several barber shops. He's cutting not just black hair, he's cutting white people's hair as well. Um, and so he, he becomes quite wealthy. If you remember the video we watched about the race riot, one of the comments made was, the front window of Herndon's barber shop was busted or broken. The barbers that were inside, there were two of them, were dragged out in the street and killed. Um, again, that's Alonzo Herndon's business. So he starts uh, a barber business, has several barber shops around the city, cuts not only black people's hair, but white people's hair as well. In 1905, he purchases, purchases an insurance company. Um, and turns it into a multi-million dollar business. He manages it very well. Why an insurance company? 
No, he starts an insurance, or he buys an insurance company. He's not buying insurance. He's buying an insurance company. What is one of the things that the black community would be lacking? Insurance. And so he buys an insurance company so that black people can now purchase life insurance. Why is that important? You know, daddy gets killed at work one day. Mom and the kids don't have life insurance on daddy. What happens to mom and the kids? Well, or worse, you know, homelessness, starvation. I'm not being too dramatic here. Um, and, and I think Alonzo Hernan recognizes this need, so he buys an insurance company and begins to sell life insurance to um, the people of the black community of Atlanta. Um, again, it was something that was needed. It may have sold property insurance as well. Black family is able to own a house. Well, if you don't have insurance and your house burns down, you're in a pickle. Okay? And so, again, a void is filled by Alonzo Herndon. Um, today, it's one of the largest um, African-American businesses in the United States, still in existence. In fact, um, some of your grandparents or great-grandparents um, might have bought insurance from the Atlanta Mutual Insurance Company. It'd be worth looking into if your great-grandparents are still alive or um, even your, probably not your grandparents because some of y'all's grandparents are my age. It's kind of scary. Well, then no. Uh, it's like Frenchie was telling me like her grandmother, her grandfather... Is like 57. It's like I'm older than your grandfather. Yeah. Grandma is 47. That's all my dad is. Grandma is 47. Grandma I'm sorry, I asked. This has been this has been videoed, by the way, so be careful what you say. All right. So the Atlanta Mutual Insurance Company today and you know, don't hold me to this figure, but the last time I checked, it was worth over $200 million and operated in 17 different states throughout the South and then some other states as well. So yes, in answer to that question, there are African Americans in the early 1900s, not that far removed from the Civil War, who become wealthy. How do they become wealthy? They take advantage of opportunities. Um, you know, they're in the right place at the right time. The same way anybody else becomes wealthy who works for it. Um, and Alonzo Herndon is, is one of those men. Now, women's suffrage, that is not what women go through when they have babies. That's not what we're talking about. No, I just go ahead and say it because, you know, I like to be silly. Uh, women's suffrage, suffrage is actually the right to vote. And... And by the way, this month is um, Women's History Month. So, so suffrage is the right to vote. Um, Seneca Falls, New York is where a huge suffrage um, rally is held or a meeting of the suffragettes, that's what we'll call it, um, where women from all over the country came together to, to talk about how to obtain the right to vote. And this is a battle. And it's really a battle that starts with the 15th Amendment. What does the 15th Amendment guarantee? Previous condition of servitude. And a lot of people thought that the 15th Amendment meant women could vote as well. Of course, it doesn't. It takes another 50 years. So in 1920, the 19th Amendment is ratif ratified. Tennessee puts it over the top. Georgia, would you like to know when Georgia ratified the 19th Amendment? Anybody want to guess? 1970. 50 years after it's ratified by the country, Georgia finally gets around to ratifying the 19th Amendment. Now, did it really mean anything? No. Women could still vote in Georgia. 
even though the state had not ratified the amendment, the country had. Um, you know, we usually get things right. It just takes us a while, right? We're a little slow. Um, one of the largest rallies in modern history was the women's suffrage movement. And when they rallied in Washington, D.C., they marched on Washington, D.C. This is a picture from that. And there were hundreds of thousands of women voting or marching for the right to vote. What does the sign say? President Wilson, this is the time to support women's suffrage, President Wilson says. Now, you have to understand something. President Wilson, by this time, has had a stroke. His, his wife, Edith, is the de facto president of the United States. She's kind of running things behind the scenes. So we don't know if that's really what President Wilson thought. I kind of think it is. Um, or Edith just decided, you know, we're going to stick the president's name on this. By the way, would you like to hear a bit of trivia? Okay, you know the answer already. You know the answer to my question. What's the answer? No, what's the answer? I'm talking about who? Woodrow Wilson, President Woodrow Wilson. Here's the question. Who's the only U.S. president buried in the city limits of Washington, D.C.? Woodrow Wilson. Okay. Lincoln's buried in Springfield, Illinois. Woodrow Wilson's actually buried in the city limits of Washington, D.C., and it gets a little, little strange, okay? He's buried inside the National Cathedral. He's in a sarcophagus. Um, in fact, if you walk in the National Cathedral through the front door, it's about a tenth of a mile from the door to the pulpit in the front, um, off to the right, is where Woodrow Wilson's sarcophagus is. There are a lot of other people buried in the walls of the National Cathedral. Helen Keller's buried there. Um, Ann Sel she's deaf, dumb, and blind. Um, what? What's racist? Wow, I've heard a lot of things, and that's on camera. Um, but anyway, uh, Woodrow Wilson's buried in the National Cathedral. So are Helen Keller and Ann Sullivan, people that you may recognize. Um, newspaper, U.S. Women Vote, you can see a couple of things here. Tennessee completes amendment ratifying 26 million win the right to vote by Tennessee action. 26 million are franchised in this vote. And then you read stuff like slain woman found weighted in river. Hmm. She got the right to vote and her husband didn't appreciate it very much. So he slew her, slayed her, he killed her. And there you have it. All right. Explain.